Professor Garga Chatterjee to address the event. So the floor is yours. Thank you. Can, am I audible? Yeah. So first of all, I would like to uh, thank the Dravidian Professionals Forum for uh, inviting me. And I would also like to provide my gratitude to CN Anadirai and M. Karunanidhi, due to whose struggles we are being able to communicate with each other in English and our uh, boys and girls have for the past few decades have been able to get education in English and do something out of that capital of progress which would probably would have been completely destroyed by 1965 if it were not these stalwarts. Which also brings us to the point that the erosion of state rights, the destruction of non-Hindi aspirations is not some recent phenomena. It has a very long history. And whenever questions like these are raised, uh, an issue comes up that there is something uh, which is trying to tinker with uh, the sovereignty of India, it's a national security question, it's an internal security question. Whenever non-Hindi states and peoples voice rights emphatically, it becomes a security question for some reason. And, uh, people do not know that uh, the official language, Rajbhasha as uh, Dilli calls it, is a subdesk within the home ministry. One wonders why language is an internal security subject, right? And that gives you the deep mentality of Dilli from day one. From day one, I would like to say, we might be observing its most uh, purulent and cancerous form in the BJP, I would like to name it at present, but it has been long time in the offing. However, CN Annadurai provided us with a, with a more real definition of sovereignty. Sovereignty does not uh, lie in Delhi. It's not uh, something which is uh, place centric. It is, the ad, it is the additive aspect of the Sovereignty that resides in Tamil Nadu, in Tamils, in Bengalis, in Gujaratis, in Marathis, in Hindustanis, in Kashmiris, in Punjabis, in Assamese, which all add up to make Indian sovereignty. And that is the sovereignty of India. It is not something which is unitary, as uh, my esteemed speakers before me have long said. However, Legally, it might be said that India is, did not form through states coming together. And, that's, and that uh, makes us different, at, le at least in legal terms, from the US Constitution, right? Where states came together and signed on a document that we are forming a United States of India. While the first line of the Indian Constitution, it's a very smart line, it says India, that is Bharat, will be a union of states will suggest that India is preformed while the states are not, right? The states are formed due to public pressure on linguistic basis. We might, we, we have named the state as Bangla. We have named the state as Tamil Nadu, but the state per se in the constitution does not mean Tamil country or Bangla. We have to get this interesting difference. We have named it as such. State is a formation which comes through, an, through the instrument of Article 1. It does not say which states. In fact, there is a certain uh, looking away as if before 15th August 1947 or 26th January 1950, Bengal did not exist or Tamil Nadu did not exist or Keralam did not exist as if, but it is not, we know. So there's always has been a way to ignore, but also to give into pressures because the states, or if we say national homelands of linguistic people are real. Which no. is why the States Reorganization Commission. Yeah, tell me that. Okay, so 
now if we go on to a very different aspect of it all all of the things we are talking about federalism constitution etc these were formed by members of the constituent assembly okay uh, who was the constituent assembly members elected by by state assemblies it was a rajya sabha yeah johor sarkar da is here who is a, a recent inductee into the rajya sabha from bengal and he represents the interest of states and the interest of west bengal in the council of states that's the role right so he was elected through an indirect election were members of the legislative assembly of bangla voted him that's the idea exactly the same procedure was followed to get what we call the constituent assembly there was no so called union election because the union was british we must remember that the states became autonomous in 1937 what happened in 47 was the transfer of delhi power we had our powers in 1937 right which is why when we are trying to form an assembly of people who will decide for the future of india it is the representatives of the states who formed the constituent assembly people might be interested to know that b r ambedkar who was a member of this constituent assembly was elected from bengal indirectly he was a member of the constituent assembly from bengal so the states actually got together to form india historically however legalistically it takes a different turn because of the wording of the constitution because whenever you have the wording of the constitution you typically have if you imagine in 1946 47 when these elections are happening through limited electorate you and with the uh, removal of east bengal and the pakistan uh, west pakistan areas of that time you basically have a rich upper caste hindi speaking dominated constituent assembly so we have the document we have a document that could be passed by such a body so we are all legatees of that kind of formation i'm going into this history because this is very important we must remember that whatever the problems we are talking about and have been talked about by earlier uh, speakers let's say article 356 which destroys something like that or the idea of concurrent list this is a unique thing by the way usa is a federation united states it has no concurrent list there is no such thing so why does a concurrent list exist in the first place we must remember this it's according to the government of india act 1935 what's happening in 1935 the british are deciding that brown people like us are clamoring too much they should get some level of self government however they should not be able to go against our interest so we should we must have a mechanism to make sure british interest is served is protected if the natives decide not to protect the british but to protect themselves which is what they are which is why article 356 which is why the governor which is why the concurrent list the kernel of this idea was always there i can tell you in the uh, pre uh, independence days akashbani and akashbani uh, all of these uh, the radio right the tv wasn't uh, in vogue that, uh, in india that much and then later duradarshan there are large archives of our greatest bengal's greatest poets and uh, literateurs etc all these archives have been moved to delhi none of our child, for, for to people for whom it has no value and for people like us for whom it means the world we don't have access to it and the final crowning glory was seen this 14 september when in 
Durodarshan Bangla, a one hour discussion was held using union government survey, uh, servants serving in West Bengal in Hindi under the topic Raj Bhasha and Rashtrobad. Official language and nationalism as they call it, nationalism in Hindi. So we can understand the erosion that has happened. This is just a small example. And that has been the trend since 1947. We all often hear this excuse in 47, the situation was not right. There were dissensions here, dissensions there, etc., etc., etc. Right? But since then to now, one cannot give a single instance where rights have moved from union to state. Not a single instance. Whenever legal constitutional mechanisms have been instituted, it has always been a scenario of some exclusive power of the state to be removed, to be moved to the union or to the concurrent list. Typically it's the concurrent list because that's a, it's a soft landing. You don't know what's happening to you, but you think, okay, you have an illusion of ret re retention, right? Which is why the concurrent list itself, the concept of a concurrent list is a grave danger to federalism because it blurs and whenever it blurs, it's real politic and power and the non-admission of petition by courts that runs the day. That's very important. Very rarely have we seen the Supreme Court of India in a question which pits the union against the state on a question of constitution, not on random issues of the Supreme Court having sided with the state. It's typically with the union under some pretext or the other. So much so even when the NEET was rendered unconstitutional by a person no less than the Chief Justice of India, a Bengali Chief Justice, if I may add, Altamas Kobir, and remember, when did he do it? On the last day of his service, he also knew the amount of lateral and otherwise institutional pressure for a CJI to actually undercut a union scheme of this kind. So he kept the judgment reserved for his last day and he delivered and then he was not the CJI anymore. He could not be held, right? A CJI's decision was recalled and reversed. That shows that the attack against federalism, the attack against state autonomy, the attack of Delhi establishment against these things is not something which happens randomly or, or, or is happening with the BJP. Remember, uh, NEET started in 2013. BJP is the most virulent form of this tendency. For example, Mr. Panir Selvam talked about the cooperatives. It's a very grave assault, but it's not very apparent. The fact that it is grave, but not apparent, tells us the, the mechanisms and the minds at work to make something like this. We are not fighting against random policy questions. We are fighting against an institutionalized force which wants to destroy Indian pluralism. We have to, which is why, a forum like this where thinking people, especially of non-Hindi states come, can get together. I'll mention why I say non-Hindi states. It's not a question of being divisive, but it's a question of reality. So as I said, residual powers in the union, very importantly, are with the union. Now remember, what are residual powers? These are things not mentioned in the union list or the state list or the concurrent list. What are things not mentioned? Things which could not be thought at that point of time. That are, those are the things that are not mentioned, right? What does that mean? That means the future. 
So as time goes on, the residual powers will become the powers. Our children will live in a different world and very different things will come up. And that all will be all will owned by Delhi. Remember this, it's a very important thing. So concurrent list has to go. Residual powers have to be with states. It's a problem, I know it is not fashionable to take the example of Pakistan. Okay. So let me take the example of USA because both have the co concept of residual powers, things unforeseen, right? From the very start, USA's residual powers lies with the states and Pakistan in the last decade through a constitutional amendment gave the residual powers to the state. I mentioned Pakistan because it is also born out of the government of India Act 1935, 37, the, the, the same sequence of basic structure, that is why. But let me take you back to a much farther, uh, longer uh, story. I'll be fast, I know, because I don't have too much time. In 1757, when the East India Company destroyed Shirajudola, the, the autonomous Nawab of Bengal, and took over, what did, it, what did the East India Company take over? Because the person who wanted to be the Nawab in place of Shirajudola, Mir Jafar, a name which is used for a betrayer to for Bengal in, to this day, like Bibishan, for example, right? So he became the Nawab. So what did the British uh, East India Company own then? It's very important. This period is called diarchy, which means all the things which require money and if you don't do it, the public will be angry. That is with the Nawab. While extracting money, this function is with the East India Company. This is called diarchy or double rule, which means police is with the Nawab. But the money to provide for the police, Nawab has to decide because the main money extraction is with the East India Company. I think you can see the continuity of that very basic system to this day. Today, the basic functions of the public to get a people running, to build it, to do everything, states are responsible. But the extraction of money, Delhi has the powers. It's no different. And they know it. The Finance Commission is a very interesting example. Finance Commission has various parameters, okay, except one. How much, let's say, how much Johor Babu will get paid, how much Mr. Gandhi will get paid, how much Mr. Dhanidharan will get paid, how much Mr. Panish Selvam will get paid or Mr. Chatterjee will get paid, will depend on many things, except how much you actually earn. Except how much you actually earn. The amount of revenue that a state itself produces that is not a parameter in the Finance Commission. Think about it, what does it mean? If you look at the various parameters willy-nilly, these are ways to make cash transfer from non hindi states to Indy states. Make that, let me state that very clearly. Which is why, which is why, when Mr. Panir Selvam very rightly says that all states should get together, let me make the point there is very little incentive for most Hindi states to get together on this because the central money does not disappear. It gets re-injected into Hindi states. All the money of any union government has two heads. If you think about it, tender or salary, right? Salary includes pension and every other thing and tender includes all kinds of procurement, etc. Now look at who gets those jobs, and who gets those tenders and where all those tender plus job projects are sanctioned. So if there is a greater equitable distribution, equitable not based on equality, but based on what I produced, what is my rightful share? 
then I do not think many of the states of the North will go with the states of the West and the South and the East. And that's a structural problem. That's a huge structural problem. The Finance Commission, this time also has included, we are talking about delimitation in 2026. The Finance Commission has basically instituted the basic logic of decommission uh, 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 delimitation willy-nilly by taking into account 2011 numbers. It has started, whether we like it or not. And because it's a union government thing, we cannot say anything, we will just see. A, a, a member of the Finance Commission from West Bengal is now an MLA from the, of the BJP in West Bengal. So we also understand it is that kind of Bengali who will be in the Finance Commission. How will he stand up for Bengal? If Cho Ramaswamy was the, uh, some representative of Tamil Nadu in Delhi, how would he have stood up for Tamil Nadu, for example? Right? It, it's th that kind of a thing. Now, if we, the need is a very similar question. And people have died, people have committed suicide. People might ask, why have people not committed suicide in Bengal? They are in the same scenario. Because in Tamil Nadu, the long history of Dravidian nationalism has made meritorious students see that in spite of their merit, they will not get a chance because they are Tamils from uh, rural areas, because they are Tamils from Tamil state board, because they are Tamils from Tamil medium, because they are Tamils from Social, lower socioeconomic backgrounds. But because there has not been a long history of Bengali nationalism, it has still not been exposed. When Bengalis from the very similar background don't find their names and they don't, they think it's lack of merit, which is why they still live in hope, which is why there is no suicide. I, I am not saying there must be suicide, but I am saying there should be unified dialogue and understanding of these things. For example, many people are saying we have to depend on the court. I hope so. But time and again, the court, as I said earlier, has completely standed with the, uh, stood with the union. For example, the Rajya Sabha we were talking about earlier, right? It's a council of states for God's sake. The fact that you have to be a resident of that state, even that has been done away with. It was challenged in court and the court said it does not matter. Something as fundamental as, as that, that has been thrown out. During the new notes, which came after demonetization, they suddenly added Hindi numerals. That was challenged in the Madras High Court. And the union government said, oh, the, 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 that was uh, not ultra-virus to the constitution. That was just a decoration. Why don't we see Bangla decorations or Tamil decorations? Why only Hindi decorations? And we never heard about that case after that. Because that's a big state thing. The order would have to be withdraw these notes. These are unconstitutional. So that requires guts of the court. Delimitation is a danger that is coming. Because delimitation will finally decide that the control of money, muscle, and mind in the Indian Union belongs to whom? There will be a unitary control, and we know which states will gain. Bengal has the lowest fertility rate in the Indian Union among the major states. It's 1.6 now. Our neighbors to the west, Bihar, is 3.4. It is not only a question of delimitation where we are bound to lose, you are bound to lose, but the fact that our voices will not matter anymore. You can sweep Bengal, you can sweep Tamil Nadu, you can sweep Kerala, but it doesn't matter here. As we say in Bangla, Kachkwala, which means something like a plantain, you know, you will get nothing. And this is especially virulent given that a party of Hindi imperialism, as they say, Hindi, Hindu, Hindustan, right? Hindi is part of that question. They want a, this Indian union 
is not a majoritarian union. It's a union of nationalities, linguistic nationalities. They want to, where every nationality is a minority, by the way. They want, it, want to make it a majoritarian union, a Hindi majority country. Remember the word country or nation does not occur in the Indian constitution. We will finally become a country, but the country will not belong to us. It's a very dangerous question. I mentioned demographic change. These are things which are often not said. It's not as if Bengalis are increasing in Tamil Nadu and becoming MLAs and MPs. It's not as if Tamils are increasing in Haryana and becoming you know, MLAs and MPs. We know what's going on and we know where BJP vote banks lie. We must say this very clearly that it is a demographic assault. It is a financial assault. It is an assault in every field. As I said, it's a control of money, as many have described. It's a control of muscle. Who gets into the Indian Army and the CRPF and the BSF? We all want to be part of it. We pay for it for God's sake, much more than in these states. But the language is somebody's mother language and somebody's learned language. Why? And then minds. Remember, NEET is not about medical entrance. It's about the aspirations of lakhs of students who will all tend towards that so that state boards will be destroyed. So any kind of professional of the future will be from families or will be from schools who in geography in Tamil Nadu will not learn about the districts of Tamil Nadu and Bengal will not learn about the seasons of Bengal. They want to create that rootless class. Indian and nothing but Indian whatever that means. And those will control media, will control all professionals, will control all bureaucracy, will control all courts, will control all voice. So that's the mind. Mini, muscle, mind. Bengal is affected, even for our ports. Beng uh, Delhi for the longest time did not give us permission to set up a second port while Mr. Adani gets permissions everywhere. Tajpur port is now being set up by the Bengal government after Arun Jetli, former finance uh, minister said that he will be starting a port in Borshagor and then completely abandon the project. No uh, asking. Mines, our mines don't belong to us. Our tea doesn't belong to us. Our jute doesn't belong to us. And we are supposed to understand we are a poor people while we are subsidizing others day after day. As Mr. Panish Selvam said, that there cannot be too much inequity between you. You cannot extract a people to subsidize others for a very long time because you have higher numbers and higher TFR and almost exclusive rights of people having guns paid by union money. Right? From freight, freight equalization, this thing has started, even for FDI. Very recently, Bengal's Premier Mamata Banerjee was disallowed to go to uh, home for a World Peace Conference by the MEA. Before that, she was disallowed to go on a business uh, investment trip to China. Modi has been to China multiple times as Chief Minister. So there, it's, there, it's a multi-pronged attack. Even certain MOUs between Chinese companies and Bengal, in, to invest in Bengal, including making buses, all were canceled, national security. Guess where a $1 billion China investment park is in India? Gujarat. There is no national security. Three things which have been mentioned and which was the last formula to, men, to maintain what they call about Okondo Bharat was the cabinet mission plan, where it clearly said external affairs, external defense and currency. These should remain with the center, whatever that is, or the union. And that is the plan for the future. And that is the plan for the future. Multiple people have voiced it. Mamata Banerjee has voiced it. KCR of Telangana has voiced it. 
M. Kaunanidhi has multiple times vo voiced it. C. N. Anandurai has vo voiced it. The committee formed by the first DMK government, it voiced it. So we have to be an indivisible union of indivisible states. An indivisible union of indivisible states because states are not mere administrative units. These are political units. And the Supreme Court has in passing mentioned as such. So I do not believe in cooperative federalism. I believe in struct a structural federation where the rights of the union and the rights of the state are completely defined and completely non-overlapping so that whether Bengal gets Bengal's due in Bengal soil and Bengal's resources does not depend on whether I can keep Dubeji or Chobeji happy in Delhi. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor Gaga Chatterjee, for such an insightful and seriously uh, thoughtful uh, speech. Of course, uh, in your line of uh, thinking, concurrent list has to go and uh, residual power should rest with the states to make federalism truly meaningful. 